Hey, Barb, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really good. My first question is, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so my name is Barb Hoffman. I'm an animator and filmmaker based in the Seattle, Washington area. And I do independent movie making. Cool. And it seems obvious we should start with the movie we just made together. Uh, or on you did for me. <laughs> uh, you just made a really great music video for my <laughs> band song, uh, Rainy Days and Crooked Sheets. That came out just last Friday. Um, I, I reached out to you for that video because I, I, I saw some work you did for another local musician. Um, and I've always wanted to incorporate an animated element into kind of what we do. But I didn't have any ideas for this video like I usually do for other videos. Uh, as I recall, I just kind of sent you the song and then pretty quickly you seemed to have a full kind of vision for what you wanted to make. So I'm curious, can you kind of talk through what your thought process was making this video? Where did the ideas like originate and, uh, and just kind of talk about working through it? Yeah, so when I first listened to rainy days and crooked sheets um usually when i i love to think of music videos first of all like that is my my dream job is to make music videos for a living which is kind of a pipe dream but i'm trying real hard to get there and um but i i think of music videos like in my daily listening to songs you know like what would i do for a music video for this song um and so i apply that to my daily music. So I just applied the same strategy to this song when I was listening to it. Um, and I honestly, what I do, <laughs> there really isn't like any rhyme or reason to like how I came up with this song. But um, I, I just laid on my bed and I like closed my eyes and I just tried to like envision what the lyrics meant to me because it was the initial idea of the video was that it was going to be kind of a simple lyric video but then it kind of morphed into a really more complex lyric video, which is really fun. Um, and I'm glad that happened, but yeah. So, and just the first image that really popped into my mind when listening to the song was um, when the lyrics appeared, um, I walk into the desert. I, I followed my shadow into the desert just to die alone, die alone, die alone. And just immediately the first image that popped into my mind was what you see on that screen right there, which is just kind of a little figure in the corner with a big shadow and then a little cactus and sun on the side. Um, and I immediately was like, all right, I like that style. I like the black and white. I think that's simple. I think that's really feasible. Um, and I wanna, you know, think of other simple uh, graphic ideas for the rest of the song that could be applied throughout. Um, and I just build it from that kind of shot there out. And um, that was kind of how I came up with the idea for the music video. So Nice. So, yeah. so that first line is kind of the mission statement and then everything else just gets built around that. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So it doesn't seem like you d did a bunch of revisions, just kind of you close your eyes and you imagine just kind of yeah. as you listen to the song, you imagine <laughs> draw it out. And, as no, but that's kind of how I... Sounds. I channeled the energy. <laughs> but it's kind of what happens to me, too. It, even when I'm not listening to my songs, I can just be listening to anybody's songs. And I, there, there's sometimes a movie that kind of plays that I can see pairing along with that. But a lot of times, I imagine there are kind of restrictions that uh, would, would limit a vision. Where, like, that always happens to me with, like, my videos. Some Usually the video ideas are way more intense. And I'm thinking, all right, I would love to see that but I can't because we don't have the budget. We Maybe we would need 300 extras, whatever it is. Uh, were there any limitations that, that you felt with this video that but basically, could you make the video you wanted or did you have to simplify your vision uh, to kind of fit the means of production? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think if I had like other ideas that weren't feasible um, that I had to cut out. And I don't, I don't think that there were, you know, because the nice part about lyric videos is that the lyrics kind of become the subject themselves as right. opposed to the animation. Um, so the audience is kind of focusing more 
on the animation as opposed to, you know, the motion or the images going on, which is really nice. It kind of, um, you know, allows a break for me from animating these elaborate scenes um, and entertaining the audience to the audience just focusing on reading the lyrics. Um, and there were only a couple parts of the music video where I did have to kind of entertain the audience for a moment because there weren't lyrics to kind of substitute. Um, but um, besides that, I don't, I think it, it turned out exactly the way that I wanted it to. I don't think um, there wasn't much cutting back that I had to do to make it possible, which was, it's usually not the case. There's usually a lot of cutting <laughs> that happens. So, yeah. Nice. Well, that's great to hear. I know it, all, everyone in our band, we, we were stoked on it. it. turned out great and went above what we were kind of imagining for the video. Uh, you mentioned that doing stuff like this is your dream job. Uh, you mentioned that just now and you had, when we approved the final draft, you sent an email saying, this is the type of work I would love to do as my dream job. And you said, having this in my portfolio will hopefully get me closer to there. But I'm curious if you can talk about more what kind of your dream job is. Because when I look at your portfolio, most of the work I see are kind of your independent projects, things where you've kind of made, like you come up with a story and you're there for every aspect of the production. Are there other, for, for most people, I could imagine taking on client jobs for music videos or anything else, it would kind of be a means where you can get money to do your own passion projects. Do, do you have other like stories of your own that you want? to tell out there? Yeah, I do. I have a lot of, I have a lot of ideas, <laughs> of course, all the time. Um, you know, one, one of my dreams, like one of my pipe dreams, I have a lot of pipe dreams, of course, um, as an artist, <laughs> but one of my pipe dreams is to animate possibly a Fantasia type kind of piece. Um, I, I would love, which is kind of like a music video almost, but like, who cares? Um, but, but, but you mean like, you know, like I, a feature length film? I always film. loved Fantasia. Yeah, exactly. To, uh, you know, old classical songs that um, were really impactful. And um, the one song that I really want to do is, um, I, it's Latin, or I think it's Latin, but I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think it's called Dies Irae where it's like um, D-I-E-S-E-R-I-E. -E. Um, and it means something, I forget. I think it's like, oh, grief or something like that. But it's this really crazy, um, it's this really crazy piece where they have this huge choir and it sounds, um, it, it like the, the song is basically almost apocalyptic. I would describe it. It sounds like the world is ending in this song. And like, there's so much percussion and um, just coordination with this choir and just major drums going on. And um, for some reason, I just like had this vision of animating like a Fantasia style piece of a, of like a huge ocean storm, like tsunami like overtaking like a small character or animal um just getting lost almost like pinocchio you know the scene where like pinocchio gets sucked in by the whale and it's just really frightening and all these waves are coming down and crashing and there's lightning and it's really dramatic um i really want to do that to this one song that's kind of one of my dreams but animating that much water and that like big of water um for that much time it's about like a three minute piece is really hard to do as a independent animator <laughs> and I, right. I feel like i'd have to like hire a team in order to produce something like that so that would be one of my dreams yeah well that's super cool i just one of the many <laughs> but like that that's interesting because the songs you've done music videos so far have lyrics and th this song, is it an instrumental? You mentioned it's classical and I usually think of those as just like, or orchestras. Are there it's words? It's classical. To it? Yeah. So, so, so the, it's kind of cool that just the music uh, itself it, kind of what would like inspire this imagery without lyrics leading the way to 
to tell you what to think because i know the lyrics in our song kind of yeah so somewhat dictated where, where the video went yeah. yeah it it does but it doesn't yeah but the, the feel also did as well at the same time you know just the whole like the lyrics plus the the tone of the song is what created the imagery which i think is really cool so right do you, do you yeah. have any music video pet peeves uh like for me what one example is like i see so many videos where just like two or three minutes into the video there will be like the, the the studio recording just keeps going but in the video they'll stop and then have like random people talking and then they start the song again, <laughs> and it totally takes me out of it um did you have anything like mm. that so like the videos you want to make where you're just like i will not do that because i hate when that's done it's it's when people don't edit on the beat or they just they aren't mm. thinking about the beating when they're listening to the song i mean songs are all about um, it's all about the beating. It's all about intuition. And of course, like people perceive beating and, and um, that sort of thing differently. Like one person will pick up on like the hi-hat of the beat versus another one will pick up on the, the kick drum or whatever music lingo. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know the drums very well, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah, it's, but like when there's just no, like rhyme or reason to the editing and it's um or like when the shots just don't really match the feel of the song um i also it, it can be done right but i'm not a huge fan of like super elaborate stories being yep. added to songs if that makes sense I, i'm um, with you like i like a little bit of story is like always good and like sometimes an elaborate story like can like work i'm not saying it's you know outside the realm of possibility of me liking it but um like when people add these like really elaborate stories like oh i met this person and then we met in high school and then we went to college together like almost like very taylor swift type like old 2000 early 2000s music videos where like there's like the whole novel you yeah. get the whole novel in your music video and you just, you just got too much going on and yeah, it's ideally like, the oh, song the song should serve that purpose and the video is exactly. kind of a supporting character the video doesn't need to tell the exact same thing the song is doing yeah yeah uh, well what i think are cool then, is, sorry go ahead oh no no ask your question i was just no, gonna I, complain more but yeah, it's, well, i was I gonna continue stop. along <laughs> i was gonna continue along the same thing where it's an opportunity uh for people to get really experimental and avant-garde with music videos where it's like most people don't they don't want to sit through a 90 minute avant-garde feature film but a music video you can make it really trippy and like the song is kind of that they're supporting it so i i'm sometimes kind of flabbergasted when i see music videos where it's just a band performing like an abandoned warehouse like something like that where you can do something really cool with, with the <laughs> video format and it's maybe not fully explored as much that was the other thing I was going to say is band shots. Like, yes. <laughs> like they can be good sometimes if they're done creatively. Um, for, like you guys, for example, do creative band shots, but I think it's such a, it's, it can be such a crutch sometimes that music video artists use. Um, it's like, Oh, let's just do a band shot here. And it's like, are you want to do something else though? <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> like we can, we can always add something else, but um, at the same time, it can be hard to find filler. And I, I totally get the, the need sometimes to resort to that. But mm -hmm. you know, if you can, if you can, if you don't have to have a band shot, I'm always, I mean, we technically have a band shot, I guess I'm a we hypocrite. Do. But, yeah. but <laughs> we it's have a band because shot in our we... music video. Um, we, we added the cool stars to it and all that uh yeah kind, kind of thing um are do you have so yeah sorry you, it's cutting out a little bit yeah you're you're frozen on my end too unfortunately all right we're, all we're, right. we're back after some quick tech <laughs> difficulties barb has <laughs> transported herself to a new room with better internet um i i, I had one more thing we were we were just talking about um kind of music videos and, and work, working on the projects you've done. I had one more kind of question in that vein, and then we'll kind of tangent a little bit. Uh, I, I was going to ask, are there any, 
I knowing that we're, we're both Seattle based, the bands that you'll be able to work with on music videos will probably most likely be Seattle based. Uh, Hey, have you started reaching out to other bands or do you have people who you're like, oh, I really want to work with that? I, I've heard their songs. I'm a fan of their sound or I, I'm like, I, I hear, I see something I want to do a video for. Um, you know, I, I haven't been, I'm really bad at the Seattle music scene, unfortunately. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in the Seattle indie scene, uh, like my friend, Mary Claire, who was, for the other um and the other stop motion music video that you might have seen earlier um and so i have a couple of friends that are in the seattle music scene but honestly like i i usually my my rhyme or reason for picking music to create music videos too isn't like based on like scenes or genres or anything like that it's just mostly you know for the most part based on what I have visions for. Um, and well, you know, well, if I don't that, have, well, well, how did that first video come about? Did Mary, Mary Claire come to you or a uh, gotcha? Did she, yeah, did she Mary, know that this was kind of your dream to do mu- music videos or did the dream come from working on that? And you realize I, I want to do more of this. Yeah. Um, Mary Claire, they, which they also go by they, them. Um, oh, okay. my bad. They, uh, no, it's all good. Um, yeah, Mary Claire um, reached out to me with this song, uh, their song, I Don't Like Drinking. And um, basically what um, what happened is that they came to me and they said, hey, you're a filmmaker. You're the one filmmaker I know at Seattle University, which is the, the university that we both attended. Do you want to make a music video? I said, heck yeah, you know it. Um, and then we both got sat down for the song and I said, okay, I have this very specific vision of you just in a bathtub full of wine. And they said, yep, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking too. Really? <laughs> and basically um, we built off that. It actually, uh, surprisingly, that piece was not supposed to have stop motion in it. Um, but, you know, as projects develop, uh, just like ours did, it started off mm-hmm. usually, you know, projects start out simple and you're really excited about them. And then you're like, wait, I want to do more. (laughs) This isn't, this isn't enough for me. I have to be more ambitious. Um, So we shot that whole music video and basically what happened is we looked at it and we're like, you know, we're not satisfied yet. We need, it needs a little, it needs needs a little bit more spice. And so what we did is that we added stop motion to the scenes that we thought we were lagging a little bit and just matched it. Um, so that, that's kind of the story of how that music video was made, which is really fun. So that's fantastic. Um, yeah. So since we're talking about music a little bit and we were talking about the Seattle music scene, I also like the Seattle music scene I often here referred to, and I myself will say like, it's a music community. There's a collaborative and kind of supportive nature where, uh, yeah, people, there's, there's, I don't know. It, there's just there. Do you feel like there's a Seattle film community in that respect? Cause I was thinking, the, the way the directors and animators work is a very isolated process a lot of the time. Um, did you, do you connect with like other local film creators? I know we have the kind of the Northwest Film Forum and SIF uh, based here. But beyond that, is there much of an industry that you've kind of been able to or a community you've been able to kind of let latch on to and feel a part of? Yeah, so for the 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 film the film scene in Seattle and more specifically the Pacific Northwest is um, it's very interesting and it's very niche. I would say, Um, you know, a lot of the filming that comes from Seattle is usually corporate. You're Mm. either, if you're actually, you know, making a full-time job gig (laughs) worth of money, like a stable full-time job, you're usually working uh, as a video producer for either Microsoft or Amazon. That's usually what you're doing. Um, as like big up professional job uh, filmmakers. Uh, and then that kind of switches though when you get more to the indie scene because there is so much music in Seattle, you do find that there is um, there is a fun little niche uh, filmmaking scene or it's like a lot of it's a lot of like skateboarding videos, 
like oh, indie cool. skateboarding videos of like old VHS cam camcorder type pieces. And then you get these like very experimental avant-garde music videos. Um, and those are always really fun. And so that that's kind of where I tend to gravitate, gravitate towards as an filmmaker. And then there's also, you know, film festivals like SIF and Pacific Northwest. And then also Nifty is another huge film festival uh, based you, you've in had the some Seattle your, area. You, you've won some awards from them, I understand. I have, I have. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually a really great festival scene. So not only do you, do you get these kind of more indie uh, Seattle filmmakers from the Pacific Northwest as well, but you also it's a great networking hub once it's festival season and you're getting like these people from LA, a lot of people actually travel from LA to Seattle to um, uh, British Columbia, actually Vancouver is another really big hotspot for filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you kind of just get this weird like collaboration amongst the West coast and it's really fun. Um, And so I've, you know, I'm in contact with a lot of people in LA, a um, few people in Vancouver. Um, and so for the Seattle scene, it's, you know, it's big. Um, and I have been able to make a community uh, based on who I've met, especially at, for my university and, you know, stuff like film club. Um, but, you know, for the most part, if you want to get into the big film industry, you either need to go to like LA or Vancouver, but for Seattle, it's a very, it's a it's a nice comfortable independent scene down, up here. So, yeah, that's how I would describe it and how I've been a part of it is that independent music scene. It's really okay. fun. You you just touched on several things I think are interesting there. The first being what were you talking about? Kind of the the kinds of in, independent film that's coming out of Seattle. It seems to be really. It's kind of funny where it seems to be drawing from the same kind of a. Uh, collective unconscious that the music scene is from like seattle being famous for like the kind of grunge thing when you mentioned like skateboarding on avant-garde things i'm like those go together and Mm -hmm. and like so so many different music cities it's like there are sounds attributed to certain cities so to hear that there are film genres that kind of come out of those same kind of environments is kind of cool to hear um, but also t- talking about film festivals, I love that idea. I've never been to a film festival, even though one of our videos w- was in one. I-, I wasn't able to go to like see it on display. I was working or something that night. But I like the idea of film festivals because almost any other art form out there, you have an audience that you can see. If you're in ballet, you often have an audience you're performing for. Music, we have audiences that we can see. Um, but like... Your your work, people are often looking at it from their phone from their phone or on a TV, so you don't get to see the audience response. So I imagine it's really cool to be at a festival and see people respond to your work. Um, do you do you care about the audience response? Well, what has surprised you if you've had any interesting things that people react to? Oh, it's such it's always such a pleasure, but also so nerve wracking at the Mm -hmm. same time to to have your work play in front of a live audience. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really, it's truly one of the most instant forms of feedback, um, which I've always found really nice. Um, especially if you have, you know, comedic parts in your videos um it's that's like the biggest instant feedback for you is like oh did people laugh at the part (laughs) they were supposed to laugh at no okay well let's (laughs) let's just move on then um but yeah no it's um it's so fun uh because like you said you know the most of the time the feedback that i receive is through comments on youtube or on instagram or facebook um, also, my cat is coming to say hi right now. <laughs> well, well, what is your cat's name? You you have two uh, you have two cats, a fish, and a bird. That's right. How? Where did you get that information? I, I try to do as much research as I can on my guests. There isn't much about you, but I knew that. So, uh, well, what are all their names? Who, who's the cat that's rolling up now? Well, my my uh, my cat's name is Rosie, um, and then I have another cat named Clarence, who's literally 
the fattest cat on earth. He is, I think, 25 pounds, um, which is really fun. Uh We call him a sack of flour, our lovable sack of flour. And then it's funny. I I don't know where you got the other uh, animals, but I I remember writing that down like sometime. But I used to have two parakeets, uh, one named Blue and Fire. And then um, I, I also used to have two fish. We used to have a lot more animals, but now we just unfortunately have cats gotcha. <laughs> we're just a generic uh u.s family <laughs> two cats um but yes yeah i forget what i was saying beforehand we, 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 we before were my... talking about film festivals and kind of the, the audience response right right um yeah because you know, it's it's so <laughs> just my my first visceral res- response to having an audience see my work is to just sink down in my chair (laughs) because it's, it's truly, it's really nerve wracking. Um, and I, I don't think people realize, you know, how much work you'll put into a video and like try to like make every second absolutely perfect. And, um, you'll just spend so many hours tweaking and finessing and, just overthinking it and then you put it in front of the audience and it's just such a different experience to be predicting what the audience is going to feel like versus the audience actually experiencing it and that's like when you're that's the moment your film becomes real you know because that's the moment that like that's the reason why you made it is so someone else could watch it (laughs) um so yeah, it's just such a surreal experience and it's really great to have that instant feedback, even though it is extremely nerve wracking. So festivals are great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. My, my half version of that, it was in college. I made, I, I uh, participated in a 48 hour film festival. I know a lot of colleges do that. So I just got some friends together and I kind of shot and did all the editing and turned it in with like 20 minutes to spare before the deadline. Um, and it was, there were so many things I didn't get a fix that I wanted to. I had audio issues that we didn't have time to reshoot. So when we actually like got to like screen it in from, in front of an audience, I did the same thing. I sunk down in my chair and I was just like, this is going to be the worst one on the lineup. I'm so nervous. But when people actually laugh, cause like it, we, I wanted to be funny. Um, yeah, it was the most rewarding experience. It, yeah. So I totally relate. To, I'm in a less professional setting than you there, but uh, I, I totally get how it's <laughs> kind of a frame response. It's kind of weird in that I know like professional movies, they'll do screen tests before a movie is finished. They'll play things in front of an audience and get that response and then they can actually change things. But you're showing it to to an audience after it's done. Le- le- reels are locked, e- even though I'm sure it's all digital, but reels are locked and just like <laughs> you're you're not changing it anymore. Have has an audience responded in a way that made you think, oh, I wish I could change this. It's out. It's already been published for two months, but I want to change it now that I see the way an audience reacted. Hmm. That was a long question. I'm sorry. I'm talking a lot. No, no, no. It, it's a good question. It's it's um, it's a valuable question. Um, you know it. I'm trying to think. I, I think the one the one film where I really experienced that was for um, a documentary I did in 2018 called Drawing John. I don't know if you had the chance I to did. watch I, that. I watched that. I, that was I, I first saw the Mary Claire, and then when I saw Drawing John, that was the thing. I'm like, all right, yes, it wasn't just a one. It wasn't like she got lucky with Mary Claire. Seeing Drawing John, I'm like, she can do this. She's the right person to work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, the biggest, (laughs) the biggest part about that film, it was, it was one of my first films. So of course there's going to be errors that you can't fix. Um, and one of the biggest parts of that film that just drives me up the wall is the audio. The audio Mm. is just atrocious, um, in that film. And it's cause I, you know, I'm a, I'm a visual, I'm primarily more visual than I am audio based. And even though audio is like, such an underrated part of film um i just i didn't have the time or energy to like put into making it good like doing the technological research and all that jazz and um so i basically just rented like a stick mic and a a zoom h4n from my university and then i interviewed my brother and um 
it it just turned out very choppy and the levels are all over the place and I just didn't know what I was doing. And so every time that an audience watches that and listens to it, it's like what we were saying before, you know, when you listen to it yourself, it's so much different than having an audience watch it because it kind of brings out those airs so much more. And I could, I could see like the audience, like visibly getting uncomfortable with like oh. how weird the sound was <laughs> um, and uh, or maybe that was in my head but you know that's what I felt at least I was squirming um, I only remember and, liking um, it I'm sure I noticed the audio wasn't pristine but it wasn't something <laughs> that made me want to turn it off I, I, I have no memories well, of the good. audio it wasn't the, the point of the thing for me um, <laughs> well, that's good I'm glad <laughs> yeah but but it is a whole lear- learning experience I, I'm sorry to interject and bring myself into this again but uh, I have a cousin who's an animator does a lot of similar work to you i don't know if we mentioned this over email or not but one of the things no. he did is he uh he uh, he asked me to do this, the music for this like personal like this six minute animated short where he designed these characters and he hired voice actors and hired me to do music and i also was like doing some sound effects for it and like you're saying there is an art to it where i had to, uh, i was thinking like, all right, so this character is entering from the right side of the screen, so I'm going to pan the audio this way. And if they take, like, if there's, like, an avalanche, I want... The sound just can't all be in the center. It's a 3D world. So the audio needs to, like, bounce and ricochet in certain ways. And, like, to map all that in an audio program, like, it's work. So it's definitely, like, it, it, it's forgivable <laughs> that you didn't have it. It's uh, it, it it's a lot of work to make, make that sound right. Um. But funny enough, it's one of the first things people that will separate like a low budget film from a higher budget film. If the audio is good, it takes it to the next level. All right. A- yep. Another festival question. Um, just what's the deal with restrictions? Because you're I wasn't able to watch what we see in the clouds until recently. Like it feels like with so many festivals, things are behind a paywall uh, You to be able to like see a lot of people's work. You need to buy some access and like. At this point, the festival is done for two months, but I still couldn't see your work. And then I, you linked it to the website. I could finally see it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, um, when you're submitting to festivals, there's usually um, a set of rules mm-hmm. that you have. Um, and one of, most commonly, one of those rules is that your film can't be published online um, when you're submitting to the festival. I mean, a lot of festivals won't even accept your film even if it's like good if it's already been published online which is really unfortunate um and so basically that that film was still under and is still currently getting submitted to more festivals um and is still somewhat on the last legs of its festival run um but you know it's just something that i have to be conscious about um i have it on my my website just for, um, cause that's kind of like my portfolio and I, you know, people want to see some of my animation. I think it's a good piece, uh, to reference, but, um, in terms of like YouTube or Vimeo, I usually keep my pieces off those platforms until, um, I really believe that, all right, it's gone through all its festival runs. Um, and you know, people who wanted to pay to see it have paid to see it. Um, let's put it on YouTube. Um, and so, and a lot of festivals will be like lenient where like, if you, if they, if you have it in one place, that's one less accessible than others. So like, if you look up what you, what you see in the clouds, it's not like it's going to come up on YouTube. You have to like see my website and go into my website in order to view it. But, um, yeah, usually you just have to be a little careful about how accessible your film is. Uh, to an audience and how easily someone's going to find it because you know if a programmer's looking for your film to see if it's online and to see if they can find it then you know you might not get into the festival so but so far i haven't had those issues thankfully but you still have to be careful (laughs) yeah that, that seems like such a hindrance to not make the work you work so hard on to be available to people to watch is is it worth it with with what you get out of a festival, um, is, is it worth it to take that sacrifice of not having your work watchable? Like when when you won the the Nifty Award, uh, which I think you've won a few, you got it for what we see in the clouds, and 
Was there another one you got it for? But like, what when you win an award, what what does that do for you? Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's worth it mm -hmm. um, to take down the film and uh, to play in a film festival because the biggest thing that you're going to get out of a film festival isn't really exposure. It's more networking um, with people that are going to help push your career in the right place. And so um, that's the reason why I think it's worth it to take it down for a short period of time. Um, because even if it was up that entire time, it's really not going to get that much traction. Really. It's mm -hmm. not until you make those connections and are co more connected to people that get more views, um, that can help maybe like shout out your film, um, that, you know, you're actually going to maybe get somewhere <laughs> and have it be worth to post online for something like YouTube. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. It does. But yeah. But yeah. Um, Cool. So you were talking about that you were in a film club in college. Um, are, are you still currently in college or did you graduate? I have, thankfully. C congratulations. <laughs> I, thank uh, you. Let, let, me, yeah. let me see if I did my, my research uh, well here. So <laughs> you doubled majored in film studies and communication at Seattle U. I did. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, you were at Bellevue College. Okay. So you, you took a lot of film courses. I'm sure you had, obviously you had an interest in film before you started college, but how did your courses kind of influence the work you're doing now? Are there, I, I'm ask, basically asking you to justify your, your college degree, but like, what did, <laughs> what did, what did you learn that was like invaluable education? No, that's a very, that's a very valuable question there, yeah. Mitch, <laughs> because that's a, that's a huge question for, um, for filmmakers is, um, you know, should I go to film school? Is that right. worth it? Um, cause it can be a pretty penny. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of things that have to do with filmmaking, especially the production of it, you can learn a lot of stuff online. So mm -hmm. it, you know, it really is the question, should I go to film school? And so the way that I would justify my, academic career in film studies is that, you know, um, I, I really enjoyed my academic career because it was densely theory based. Um, mm -hmm. so there's usually two sides to film school. You either go to film school to study film, or you go to film school to produce film. Um, if you're going to like a school like Chapman, um, or, you know, there's there's like other really big name schools out there that are there for producing films. Like you're learning how to be a director. You're learning how to cast. You're learning how to write a script. You're learning how to budget. Um, but my education was actually film theory based. So we, you know, every week we sat down and we watched a film and we talked about why is this film important? What did this film mean? What was it trying to say? Uh, how does this relate to the history of film? How does this relate to now? You know, how does it make you feel? Um, and both are really, really important educations to have as a filmmaker. But I think the theory side gets lost sometimes in people. Um, they forget how important it is because we're all thinking about the technological side of like, oh, how am I going to make this? I want to make this. How am I going to make this? But then the theory side says the why. Why am I going to make this? Why is this important? Um, and that's why I liked my education is because I got to explore a lot of the why. And um, I also, when you go to film school and you specifically learn film theory, um, you get exposed to so much more cinema than you yourself personally would be pushing yourself to consume. Mm -hmm. So I got to <laughs> one of the films, I'll tell you a little story about one of the films I was exposed to, which is actually getting a very popular run now. I've heard a lot of people talk about it now, but when I watched it, it wasn't that popular, but my, um, I took a Latin American film studies class. Um, and one of the filmmakers that we studied was Alexander Jodorowsky, who's kind of a, He's kind of a well-known Chilean uh, director, but he's really well-known for this one film he made called The Holy Mountain. And I've never watched this film before. <laughs> I never uh, heard of it. 
or anything of the sorts. And it's hands down the weirdest film you will ever watch in your life. It is just like too bizarre to explain. They have just like inexplicable images of just complete absurdity. And like, I, I couldn't even like pick a scene to recap to you. You just have to watch it. And it's just experiences like that at film school, you know, you're just getting pushed to watch things that you wouldn't watch in your normal life. And I just love it. And I think that really influenced, you know, how I make absurd stuff now, <laughs> you know? Um, so so, so this, the, yeah. this Chilean movie, did you like it? And now when you're making things where you're thinking like, oh, I want to make something that has, an, <laughs> I, you probably don't want to go all in, but you're like, I want to pull an element from that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think it definitely influenced my filmmaking in that, um, you know, a lot of those films that I watch made the audience uncomfortable on that, purpose. That's an under, yeah, that's an underrated thing in filmmaking. I, I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, having like one of my favorite parts of films is, um, I mean, it's kind of a trope, but having eyes like or having something watching you in a film. Oh, right. Um, like having something watch you back and like purposely making the audience uncomfortable. It just I don't know. It's stuff like that fascinates me. Um, you know, like, why is the audience getting uncomfortable? You know, why is the music mm -hmm. happening? Like, one of my favorite directors is, um, who's really good at this, <laughs> is David Lynch. Yes! He's really I, good at I, making... I knew you were going to bring him up. I, yes. <laughs> He's really good at making the audience uncomfortable, especially with his film Eraserhead. Yeah. Um, and, like, this really specific scene where... Um, he has like a, a group of puppies suckling on like the the mother's breasts while mm -hmm. she's laying and he just puts in like just the most disturbing noises of like it's like it's over it's like it's way too loud it's oversaturated yep. and it just makes you feel it's like supposed to be kind of a wholesome image but it like it, it just becomes too uncomfortable and I love it <laughs> I love stuff like that yeah <laughs> I think it's just so fascinating well, well, well so. yeah but before we like finish we'll have to just like spend a few minutes talking about lynch a after this but uh <laughs> but we're still talking about you here uh but then <laughs> yeah don't don't let that slip away um what was i just all right that that answers a lot of questions i actually had so i'm like little, look uh, apologies to the audience i apologize barb that like that i'm looking down so much of my notes here <laughs> How um, dare you? Yeah. You're not allowed to be prepared. <laughs> um, yeah, let, let's get to plug in you a, a little bit. You recently launched uh, a new website. It's Barb Three Films, um, and your website's tagline right under under your name. Uh, it described you in this order: animator, director, and editor. And I'm sure you thought about the order you put those in. I asked <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of musicians I talked to. They are multi instrumentalists. They do guitar, bass, sing. They do drums. They also mix and produce. So, I a, a question I occasionally ask in this podcast is like, if you were to rank the things you do best or the things you want to be most most known for, and a lot of people struggle with it, but is that the order that you kind of see yourself in, uh, animator, director, editor? Yeah, I think um, I think in terms of ranking, animator and director are almost tied because there there is a lot of stuff that I would love to direct, but I just don't have um, you know the capability to produce right now because mm -hmm. it's COVID and you can't work with people. Um, so you know the first thing that I put down is animator because that's the most feasible thing for me to do right now is that animate um, during COVID, and then I also love directing. Uh, so that's my my second ranking, and then my third ranking is editing because I also have a immense uh, love for editing and you know how to you you know pace films like, like we were saying earlier. It's all about the beating, and I love feeling the beating of a film and you know seeing how you make something flow. Um, and a lot of people always need an editor, so <laughs> I've always yeah. put that on my title card as well so that's kind of the reasoning behind that <laughs> yeah uh, tier. <laughs> you, you have other creative skills that I, that weren't included on there like your instagram before you turned it into a film page it was like all photography and you take a lot of photos is that something you're so interested in doing or or what would you want people to hire you for photos or is it just like i'm all about video now 
<laughs> yeah, I actually, yeah, I did try to um, do photography just for, you know, a fun hobby for a little bit. Um, and I still do. I still really love photography. Um, but I, I don't know. It just, there's something about a moving image that captures mm -hmm. me so much more than a still one. And um, I really love still images. And I think still images can say so much, which is so powerful, um, you know, to have some something that is still and not moving say a lot. Um, but, you know, I, I just, the way that I think <laughs> and the way that my brain works um, just loves uh, shooting moving images so much more um, just because I love the, the, you know, the material of time, because like, right. if you think about it, like time is a material, it's an artistic material that you can use, you know, either music or filmmaking, like time is like a, just like if you would use paint to paint a painting, you use time to create your piece, to create your beating. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love that. There's just something that is irresistible to me. So I love photography. Um, and it's also, it's so hard to break into the like photography world because there's like so many good people already. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's the same thing what you were saying with, with like Seattle film. It's a lot of corporate things and photography. It's like wedding and event photography. Like it, that's yep. probably like the, the only things that really pay that well or occasional band shoots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we touched on this a little earlier where I was asking you kind of if there were obstacles you had um with like making our video or other videos and you said like no everything i kind of wanted to do i was able to do with animation it, you have all the skills to do that but uh but because you also like do some live action stuff i imagine that's where there can be a lot more hurdles because i i bought my first like uh camera last year and just looking at how expensive lenses are and so like if you want a certain lens <laughs> that is definitely like a hurdle uh, for your vision or if you want like a cool dolly shot or some kind of crane shot like no nobody has that so like i imagine there are so so many hurdles that can like complicate a vision you want to make when when it comes to uh yeah physical film so i get my my question with this is like is there something you can't do that you're like when, when i'm able to do this i want to do that like like helicopter shots or crazy things <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. There is a film that I make I want to make so bad. Um I I I really want to make uh um a climate change piece. Mm. Uh that's all shot with top-down drone shots. Um which is like very specific, but it, you know, like bird's eye view when you think of right. a bird's eye view shot, it's like straight down, uh very like Wes Anderson symmetrical. Mm. <laughs> um Going and, back to um, the film theory thing, that's such a cool device. Yeah. yeah. Right. And um, I just, that's like one of my, my top 10 dream films to make is just this film that, um, you know, because I'd also have to make it with other people mm -hmm. after COVID is over um, because I want there to be movable characters that you can, um, you know, hear in the, that are the subjects of the film. Um but yeah, I think that's, you know, when, once I'm able to like buy a drone um, and like get a drone that, or get, you know, because drones usually only have like a 30 minute lifespan oh, right. in terms of their battery, which is like just such a terrible thing for like shooting times and like having a shooting schedule. Um, we, but, like, we used to drone in one to, of our videos and it was, yeah. Yeah. It, it was hard. great to have, but there were complications with it yeah there there's a lot of complications with it um so if i had the time and money to make that film that would that would be so fun <laughs> so drone film yeah we, we don't need to go too into deep but i am curious about like nerding out with this because uh that now uh, since, since you mentioned theory i'm thinking of all the like things i learned in like my media communication classes um so like uh, I, I like if you shoot from like a low angle and like it's somewhat it kind of gives them a position of power kind of thing. You you saying mm -hmm. you want to shoot like something where it's like almost entirely bird's eye view. What 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 is that conveying emotionally that you think is different from like a a, a horizontal landscape view? Is there something that makes that it, really yeah? 
I mean, um, because I want the subject of that film to be climate change, I mean, it literally makes the land the subject in order when you're filming from that type of angle and so high up, it makes the land a part of the, it makes the land a character almost is what we would say in film theory. Um, You know, because characters don't just have to be living human beings or animals. It can be, you know, especially in animation, you know, (laughs) anything can be a character in animation. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it literally will make the land a character. Um, And it also, you know, it plays with, uh, perspective, you know, how big is the human compared to the land? And, you know, what does that mean? It Like, do we, like, we're so small compared to our large earth, yet we have such a large influence over it. And it really like drives home the point that this is our home and we need to take care of it. Um, and just kind of the, also the having the humans be so small, can also create a sense of anxiety because we're so used to having close-ups of faces when we watch films and we watch characters. And so it's supposed to invoke a feeling of anxiety because you want to see the face when they're talking and you want to see what their emotions are, but you can't. And so it's, it's hopefully to make this one grand uh, scaling film of anxiety and um, just kind of to, represent i think the anxiety that you know our generation is facing when we look at kind of the science behind how we're living and how that's affecting our planet and how much time we have left so that's great it's kind of the uh i hope i'm picking the right author here was it joseph campbell who had like the man verse uh nature man versus god or is, or is I forget who like kind of categorized all these different things, but anyway, your your thing is kind of it's kind of combining man versus nature and man versus self, right? Like where yeah, yeah, and I kind of that's a really interesting, yeah. I, I hope that you're able to make that happen. I know drugs are expensive, <laughs> but it's like within within the realm of price where it's expensive but not unreasonable. Hopefully, so yeah, fingers crossed you can right. make that a reality. All right. Um, I don't want to hold up too, too much of your time here. This is show and tell. And I'm curious, what did you bring for show and tell? <laughs> well, you know, it's a little unfortunate because when I switched scenes, mm. I kind of forgot to bring my stuff with me. But I do have things from my childhood lying around me that I can pick up right now. So I might okay. just show that. Yeah. Um, and I think what I'm going to show, it's so random. Um, so I'm currently living in the house that my dad technically grew up in um, because we bought the house from my grandparents. And so when, um, but when I was younger, this was still my grandparents' house. And (laughs) this is actually sitting next to me is one of the toys that we like, because when you go to your grandparents' house, you know how you didn't have many toys to play with. You had like a select set of like old toys that you were like all right this is this is fine we, we played play with, the, with this we played with the brooms at my grandpa's house because that was, we played broom <laughs> tag because there was like nothing else to play with but broom tag was amazing <laughs> yeah um but basically we just have this one which is so fitting that i have a winnie the pooh mug right now but i have a winnie the pooh set Oh, um, like, <laughs> I I know this set. I didn't own it, but I recognize this. Yeah. And there's also, it comes with a little Christopher Robin that's holding up. I don't oh. even know. Oh, it's a drawing of Pooh. I don't, I don't think you guys can see that. Oh, it, but, it, it comes out, it comes in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, And then it comes with like a little like pots of honey. Um, And yeah, we would spend hours just playing with this piece of plastic because it was the only thing <laughs> for us to play with um, but that, that's so, the, you know, I, I love winnie the pooh my me and like there was a winnie the pooh right. movie that came out when i was in college that me and several college friends we went to the theaters to see like I, I have a winnie the pooh mouse pad that i do most of my like work on it's yeah winnie the pooh's great streaming on disney plus cr- folks yeah <laughs> are, we, are we plugging winnie the pooh now <laughs> if they pay me i will yeah I, I'm, I'm not yeah. at the sponsorship level yet. <laughs> oh, that's that's such Sponsored a cool by toy. Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, yeah, it's fun to have. Did Brings you have a favorite a uh, Winnie the Pooh character? Oh, I uh, probably Tigger. Tigger's always fun. Yeah, yeah. There is. Yeah. Sorry, no. it's all good. 
I, it might have to be just Pooh for me. Uh, like, I, yeah, it might be Pooh. I like him a lot. Yeah. And Piglet. P- I mean, they're all great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can you go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Ra- Rabbit's arrogance is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Rabbit's the only one I don't like. <laughs> He's kind of like, I almost... Rabbit's kind of like the Squidward of the show to me, where he's exactly. kind of the grump, and but uh, yeah, he he plays off the other characters well. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, I want to give the last word to you. Are there any upcoming projects uh you, you want to plug, or how can people stay in touch with you if they want to see more of your work or work with you? Oh, well, that's fancy. Um. Yeah. Well, first of all, check out the rainy days and crooked sheets video if you haven't seen that yet um worked worked many hours <laughs> 158 <help>. hours i think <laughs> to be exact to be precise and hey, one i'm very, I'm very yeah, yeah hey, is, exactly. is, was it really that much time or because like i i can see how many hours i've had my recording sessions open in terms of, like the sessions open but i leave and go make dinner and come back and it logs that time too was it actually that many active hours I'm really? very particular about like what time I log and how long okay. I, I mean, to be granted, like yeah. uh, some of that time is due to exporting probably as well. So it might be oh, more sure. like one forty-five or one fifty. I'll, 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 um, but yeah, yeah, I'll take it though. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for doing that massive amount of work on the video. Yeah, it turned out no. great. I've gotten some really good comments. Uh, I think I've shared a couple with yeah. you, but pe- yeah, people have said nice things and, if people haven't seen it, it's uh, on our YouTube channel. It's on Barb's website. And, oh, and, exactly. and your, your website, barb3films.com? Exactly. Yeah, check out um, any of my latest work there. I also have an email list there if you want to subscribe. Um, you'll get notified on all the latest and greatest projects of Barb Hoffman. And then, you know, also check out my Facebook page and my Instagram. Uh, I post... I'm trying to post more regularly on there, you know, now mm-hmm. that now that I don't have as much going on in terms of projects. Um, but yeah, and then also you can contact me at barbhoffman33 at gmail.com for any inquiries for working together. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's how you can reach me. And I hope you do. <laughs> I, I hope <laughs> you guys do watching. too. Yeah, Barb was great to work with. Uh, yeah, very quick on the email. She, yeah. <laughs> Turn around a fantastic product. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for talking today. It was nice to get a little more insight into what you do. Yeah, it was great to be on. Thanks for having me. Cool. Later, everyone. Bye.